options for that. Uh, this is the, the uh, open global mind call for Thursday, July 20th, 2023. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, we spent two, two extra days in Cabo. We, we, um, we attended a workshop that was an hour and a half up the west coast, the Pacific coast of Baja, at the loveliest place I've ever seen that you saw very briefly last week. Uh, and then we spent two days in Cabo afterward, which is probably a strategic error. Um, we had done something like this before in Mexico, where we stayed in Cihuatanejo, which was lovely. We had a great time, and we were like, "We're going to get to see the locals and do whatever." And it turns out that um, turns out that Cabo is more of a kind of a party town than we're than is our flavor. Um, so it was interesting, uh, but it's nice to see everybody. I will be MIA next week because I have an engagement where the active day is actually Thursday in Geneva. Uh, so I'm, I urge you to plot, scheme, plan, uh, mess around, and see what um, see what you'd like to do together. Did not see the volcano at Popocatépetl. <laughs> is it in Baja? Um, Where is Popocatépetl? I thought it was coast of Mexico City, but I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure, but I did see a video of there was an eruption recently, but it's calmed down. <laughs> well, that's yeah. good. I, th I think it's near the city of Puebla, because uh, when I was in Mexico just before the, uh, the COVID outbreak, we went uh, quite close to it because it was smoking and emitting a bit of fire. Very interesting. Um, we were we did a vacation, a family vacation with April's sister and family to Ecuador. I don't know, almost a decade ago now, not quite. And Ecuador is really teeny tiny, has 91 volcanoes or something like that. It's insane. It's and, and, and Ecuador turns out it's very vertical. So most of your drives are going up a mountain, down a mountain, up a mountain, around a mountain, whatever. And then there's a city called, I think, Riobamba that we went to and stayed in for a night or two <clears throat> that has three volcanoes in sight. It's like this one there, this one there, and this one there. And the city is in the valley between three volcanoes. I'm like, I'm just shocked the city's still there. It's it's just pretty interesting. Um, anyway, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, Shimon, good to see you. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, Kathleen, is that Mike or is that actually Kathleen? <clears throat> um, it says it's Mike. Uh, Mike Nelson's joining us and Kathleen's phone. And Mike is driving. Oh, I just saw that. Thank you. Perfect. So don't let go of the wheel, Mike. Cool. And we cannot hear you. You're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. So um, yeah, don't troubleshoot Zoom connections while driving either. But uh, thank you. Pardon? Oh, good. Now we're hearing you, I think. Excellent. Um, why don't we do a check-in round? It's been a couple of weeks since we did a regular check-in. Uh, I will explain the check-in protocol as we've got it standing now, the S protocol. And uh, <clears throat> then I'll step back and let, let everybody kind of step in as they wish to. Uh, the protocol it goes roughly this. I will not sort of be traffic director between. Uh, hold your, raise your Zoom hand uh, thus <clears throat> when you want to step in. Uh, the display will show each of us in the same order as our hands are raised, so you'll know who's next and, and whatever. Uh, pause a little bit before stepping into the conversation, please. And the way we know that you know the drill is you'll kind of unmute yourself uh, when, you're, when you're next, but then you can take as long as you feel before stepping into the conversation. Uh, we will not go into discourse until everybody is checked in once. So don't come back in until either everybody's passed or uh, or checked in. And then we'll switch into, mo into conversation mode where whatever was interesting for us during check-in can be our topic or whatever else we want to do. Um, and um, what am I missing about the protocol? I guess that's kind of it. Pause. Yeah, well, I, I did. I did say that. I, uh, oh, yeah, but sorry. Thanks, thanks, thanks for emphasizing it, though. And uh, so, with that, actually, let me check in 
first. I'm just going to go and then and then step back. Um, and uh, we just spent a week with uh, the Modern Elder Academy in Baja. It was started by Chip Conley. Uh, Chip was the founder of the Joie de Vivre Hotels, and he has some kind of crazy innate design sense. And so does his partner, who is an interior designer <clears throat> named Oren. And with two other people, a landscape architect and an architect architect, the four of them have this bizarrely magical design sense that creates really great space. So the physical space, once, once we got to this place, and it, it was sort of unassuming from the street, it just looks like a couple of nice walls and some, some greenery, uh, but then you start walking inside and it just it discloses itself to you as you turn around. I didn't get to ask Oren if he's a if he's a fan of pattern languages, but I, I, everything I saw hummed uh, the way a well-designed pattern language aware uh, place would have, would have uh, hummed. And also, every last corner was paid attention to. Meaning, you would you would go you would sort of turn around and you'd see like this beautiful little patio with a tile fountain in an area that wasn't highly trafficked that was just sort of the backyard of a little of a room that had a, a view or something like that and then you would see a compound curve where some co concrete had been poured uh, for some bleacher kind of seats around a, a fireplace uh, and then there would be custom pillows that were perfectly color matched to the vases that were strategically placed uh, around it, et cetera, et cetera. It was straight out of Architectural Digest without being pretentious. It was just cared for. And I just so appreciated that. And then the people helping us were really special and, and uh, worked really well. And it just, the, the container for meeting was beautiful. It wasn't rustic uh, like other places I've been uh, for other kinds of retreats. It was uh, much higher higher end than rustic, but it was really beautiful. And it was a bunch of writers showing up because April is a member of Silicon Guild, which is a bunch of writers. So the topic turned to writing and all that. And we, um, but at first the, the Modern Elder Academy or MEA has a bunch of things that they like to do to bring you closer, deeper. Uh, anybody who's been to these things or facilitated these things is aware of kind of the, the process of, of getting people a little closer to each other. And they did that really well. Um, and it was really interesting. I learned I, there were a couple of people there who I had known a very long time ago when I was sort of doing the tech analyst thing. Uh, so there were a couple of tech analysts from back in the day whom I had never really sat down and talked to. And I feel like I know them a whole lot better now. And a couple of people floated book ideas. Uh, and then toward the end, uh, one person who was there was Chris Ye, Y E H. Uh, who is a lovely fellow. He's the co-author with Reed Hoffman of Blitzscaling and a couple other books. It turns out that he can generate prose faster than just about anybody you can imagine. And that's one of his great virtues. He's also an active note taker in meetings, understood me and my brain from the get-go. And in fact, I had met him two, three weeks, maybe a month before this event for the first time, because April had a call with him and said, you guys ought to talk. We did. And like soulmates in, in, in the sense of all the stuff that we talk about here and more. Um, and so, so Chris was like, Jerry's probably not going to ask for some time here because he thinks he's here as a plus one, but we should talk about his stuff. So I had a, I had a turn at the sort of brainstorming session with everybody toward the end of the week. And, uh, I've been, I'm on this, I'm on this uh, may perhaps quixotic quest to say that our future is cyborg. And I like the word cyborg, but it does not get good traction. And what I mean by our future is cyborg is, I believe we are melding with technology more and more and more. And as the technology gets more and more capable, uh, we are going to um, uh, it, it, we are either going to be replaced by this technology, or we are going to be augmented or enhanced, uh, or whatever word you want to apply uh, to that by it. And that will turn us into kind of moderate superhumans in a sense, because there's just so much power now. Uh, in these systems. And I think it's going to change a lot of things. It's certainly going to change jobs, job categories, job descriptions. It's going to change uh, how we think and how we think together. It has all these detrimental effects of what is authentic, what is not authentic, what is what is a fact, what is not a fact, how do I check a fact. There's a bunch of other, other things there. Uh, my own take on the cyborg thing isn't all about generative AI, but is in fact about the blending of active human curation and note-taking and this AI. And I think that that 
that that may be more unique than I think it is in the sense of a lot of people have given up on note taking. And one of the arguments of this generative AI coming in is that it's obsoleting human note taking. We should just stop taking notes because all we have to do is ask the machine. And that scares the hell out of me. So, um, so I got some pushback on the use of the word cyborg. It, most people were either neutral or negative on it. And I like reclaiming it the way that uh, Jews reclaimed cat fur hats in Poland in the 18th century. I don't know when it was that they were being persecuted and forced to wear things, which they then made part of the official dress of uh, you know, a, one, a couple branches of Orthodox Judaism. And uh, so I, I think that reclaiming things is, is useful and interesting. <clears throat> and I ended up sort of like, whoops, need to find some, some new language uh, for it and see what happens. But um, it was all really useful and fun. And, um, and I also just learned, just absorbed a lot from other people about <clears throat> their uh, approaches toward writing, thinking, being, uh, all those kinds of things. We had a, a lot of great discussions that way. Um, and I, and, oh, and, um, in the entry, um, I, I, of course, sort of did this during meetings and taught everybody the, the jazz hands, which we used a bunch, but then they have a gesture that they created for their, and they call it polishing the pearl. And I had not run into it any place, but it was when somebody says something that touches you or that's, that's the, you know, whatever is <clears throat> polishing the pearl. I see it as different from, and a nice addition to jazz hands, which is agreement. I like what just got said. I don't like what just got said. This is sort of, it's a little bit like, you know, uh, I'm holding the person who said it or something else, but feel free whenever you want to, to do this. It's visible nicely in, in Zoom as well. It's very nice in a room because a lot of people doing this uh, was a way to pass the, the voice from one person to the other, et cetera. Um, so I, with that, I am complete and I will step back and not intervene until we've gone through the round unless somebody joins who could use some steering and off we go. I'm going to use the last part of what Jerry said to pivot into something that has me very emotional. So when he talked about the cyborg thing, I immediately thought about Gabrielle, our note taker here, who introduced herself and said, hi, I'm Gabrielle. And it kind of bothers me. I would rather have something saying, you know, Gabrielle is an AI. You know, I'm not usually for discrimination, but I wouldn't mind discriminating against AIs as opposed to what's really bothering me. Earlier today, I was watching C-SPAN and I was watching uh, Doug LaMalfa. He's a congressman in California who just got a conservation award from CPAC for being, I don't know, I guess you get award for being against conservation because he seems absolutely horrible. But his latest thing is he doesn't think that a breeding mother pig should be able to have enough room to turn around in her crate. And I forgot the amount because I was busy all morning, you know, and I didn't really have time to get the facts, but he gets uh, quite a bit of money from the pork industry. And, you know, before this call, I was on the phone with my friend and we just touched on like every issue there was. And we started with the pharmaceutical industry, but I was just saying how that one thing could actually weave into food production, technology. I mean, it just everything. So anyway, that right now I have a jumble of thoughts in my head, but the point that I was making to him, and I guess what I'm hoping to put here is even something with Doug LaMalfa and Congress, which connects to corruption and politics and the food bill and nutrition and pharmaceuticals and AI. If we could find one story to start with that actually touches on so many other things that could bring in all these pieces to unite people, because um, we know that people react emotionally. Many people do care about animals, especially if you're a dog lover, a cat lover, you hear these stories about animals. Maybe that's not enough to change your mind, but it's enough to get your attention. 
And once they get your attention, when you then find out how this guy is getting all this money from the pork industry and you care about corruption in government, well, maybe that pulls you in. And then you find out the next thing because he's also against you know, the, um, the standards that were agreed upon in 2016 for electric vehicles. And then that pulls you in. So I'm just throwing that out there because I have to get rid of all these emotions. And <laughs> thank you. You're muted, Stuart. Thank you. So just very quickly, I think we need to keep delivering the messages of what we observe. But in some way, from a, a larger, bigger perspective, we also need to remember that folks uh, operating in this way, um, in many ways, are just operating inside the culture. And they reflect exactly who it is that, that we all are and those pieces inside of us. It, it's just the soup that we're in. Um, and I just think that that's kind of important because um, the more we demonize, um, the more oppositional uh, we tend to create in the world. And I think that that's not the path to um, any kind of um, salvation uh, or enlightenment or um, a path of resolution. I have spoken. I thought we were doing check-ins today, are we? Yes, we were. And I had done the introduction sort of right when you stepped in. So uh, you actually answered back rather than checking in. And I was almost going to step in and say so. <laughs> um, but hey, so we are in check-in mode. And I, I, I was talking through the, the protocol earlier, which I think you're quite familiar with. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. And thank you for being here. That was my check-in, Stuart. That's what I'm preoccupied with. <laughs> all of thoughts and not being able to get this message out. Great. So let's. <laughs> so then you can consider that my check-in. <laughs> I mean, I could report on a lot of shit that I'm doing, but I think that was more the check-in that I probably wanted to share at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Let me quickly add that I have a headache. So if I close the thing and I close my eyes, that's why. So I'll uh, take the turn on uh, checking in. Uh, I've had been having some interesting conversations uh, yesterday and uh, this morning, rather this morning in the Netherlands, uh, about uh, designing a set of conversations uh, between uh, 16 to 18 year olds with uh, elders of society, 66, 67 years old and older. Uh, the feeling is uh, that we are living in a time of intergenerational illiteracy, uh, where most young people don't know anything about what older generations uh, value or think is important. And most older people don't know too much about the, what the younger people value or think is important. And if you look at the population statistics, and I did that for the European uh, Union, 
uh, under 18s and over 66 year olds make up one third of the population of Europe and uh, they tend not to be listened to because uh, the youngsters uh, uh, aren't able to vote yet, probably haven't started university, so what do they know? And the elders who have retired uh, don't, uh, don't get their calls answered and don't get listened to because they should be busy, busy with grandparenting. So uh, I'm in discussion with uh, World Values Day. Uh, that's an international organization with uh, uh, roots and anchors in 30 or more countries throughout the world. Uh, every year, there's an annual campaign to increase the awareness and practice of values around the world. And lots of people are able to uh, create their own activities uh, with uh, young people and old people. But uh, what I'm working on uh, organizing is one of the first activities that brings uh, the elders of society together with the youngsters of society to find out what each other actually thinks is valuable. Uh, so we're looking to do something on the 19th of, of October. That's the date of World Values Day this year. Uh, hoping to get uh, people, uh, either school children or uh, other young people uh, from uh, five or six different countries in Europe, Middle East and Africa, or being more or less in similar time zones, uh, to talk with uh, people who are uh, already retired, older than 65, 66. And this will be a prototype for a whole series of uh, conversations about values, which we are hoping to organize in the next year. Uh, hopefully to be uh, uh, summarized and presented as results to uh, the United Nations, uh, where there are a number of contacts within the organizers of World Value Days. So uh, if this is successful, uh, we'll try to branch out to do Europe and North South America uh, as a follow-up to uh, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and eventually uh, Europe and Southeast Asia as well. So I'll keep you uh, informed about this during different check-ins. And if there's opportunities for you to join uh, these type of conversations, uh, uh, you're most welcome to do so. That's my check-in for today. You know, maybe I go next. I didn't really have a plan for anything specific to check in with, but uh, uh, I'm working on a on an interesting project. I got commissioned by the Climate Reality Project to develop a 15 minute introduction to their new training course, which is focused on regenerative agriculture and 
they also partnered with the uh, Kiss to Quant organization to uh, to develop this. So you know, they, <clears throat> I'm going to um, be a lead in, and then it's following up with uh, a number of uh, specialized topics. So that's really um, that's really exciting. And uh, I had a conversation yesterday. I bounced it off on the uh, leader from the uh, the sustainability uh, network professional network which is like 350,000 members an international group um and uh the uh the guy who runs it is in is in England Hamish famous Hamish Hamish Taylor and so I sent him my draft and he got all excited and called me and uh dedicated two hours of his time to talk me through it and and give me feedback on it so that's uh that was encouraging but then i went uh back and scanned the news channels and i came across uh an interview with john Kerry in congress that apparently he had a hearing and that was the most astonishing line of questions there was a republican who was running john Kerry, who spent you know, a lifetime uh, in uh, uh in the climate world spent in, in you know, one of the leading experts in the world who has all the information on his hand and here's this one guy uh repeating every uh fox news line on um why climate change is just not really happening and why this uh, whole co2 doesn't really matter much I was just stunned by the idiocy of this conversation, and John Kerry was totally stunned. I mean, you could tell he didn't he didn't know what to say because the statements this uh, congressman made were just so off the wall. Um, and then you you think, how can people like this make it to a, a governing body that determines the investments of billions of dollars you know, to guide our economy into the future? So, yeah, still you know, long, long ways to go. So, which is why I'm uh, starting to focus more on local. Uh, there's uh, uh, Bend is a you know, small community, but we have one church here that uh, that runs what they call a family kitchen, and they're serving fourteen thousand meals a, a month out of this small space. And now the city wants to give them. A uh, bigger kitchen and and uh, get get this whole food system uh, organized locally. So I love getting into this and and uh, and um, have a real life uh, project to learn you know, how and and observe how uh, these systems work. But when you have noticed this uh, uh, thing that I just did for the climate reality project. And you really immerse yourself <clears throat> how our food system is structured. Uh, this is the most anti-competitive market in the world when it comes to food. I mean, it's so regulated, um, uh, you know, food safety and, and such a exaggerated um, regulatory frame um, that it basically uh, uh, knocks off all small vendors, street vendors, and so on. It's very difficult to uh now to sell uh, uh, your products and to certainly to get into to get into the markets um so that's really you know co the, the community level engagement you know you got to get in with the city council you have to get in with um, the local regulatory agencies you know, to see where the bottlenecks are and how you can untangle this knot um so you now basically it's one step at a time um but when you look around um the globe i mean there are crop failures around the globe already that that already exact, uh, exceed what happened last year so um so this will this will be you know an interesting an interesting uh year to observe and and of course you know, this is the year for the farm bill to to get put in place for the next five years right and if we get this wrong um i mean the um the impact of you know, continuing this this 
the system would just be traumatic. I mean, the uh, 10 years ago, I, I listened to what is now King Charles talking uh, uh, at, a, at a speech, you know, at, at, uh, uh, at a conference here in the US, um, Georgetown University, and he was saying, the system is unsustainable. Unsustainable means cannot continue in perpetuity. And we are debating and arguing over what the end date is, right? There is general agreement it's not sustainable. There is just like, you know, is it what, 2030? Is it 2050? Is it 2100? And the reality is it's right here now. You know? And, and uh, <laughs> that means you can't continue doing what you're doing because the damage it is causing it's just, you know, it's just uh, unbearable. You know? So anyhow, uh, just rambling across here, uh, but by golly, we got to get some intelligence uh, voted into the political bodies that are governing us. It is just catastrophic to see just complete idiots uh, you know, in, uh, in these decision-making roles and positions. Every now and then in Quaker meeting, we'll, we'll have a meeting for vocal ministry, which means, hey, we've had a couple meetings go by and nobody stood up and had messages. And, uh, or there's some other dysfunction. And in Wilton monthly meeting where I was um, a, a very happy attender a participant uh, member, um, we had one guy named John Lee who would speak almost every time. And so we had a meeting for vocal ministry in which everybody kind of spoke. And then about near the end, he said, I know I'm the problem. And then we went forward from there. Um, but please feel free to jump in and check in. This is our check-in round. I love the silence, but uh, there's no reason to be bashful or whatever. So I guess I'm up. Indeed you are. Whoever puts their hand up the, starts the queue and then anybody else who wants to go next, uh, put your hands up and we follow that order, Doug. On the iPad, somehow it cuts off the top of the top uh, frames. That's problematic. I can't see my hand. Anyway, uh, what's been on my mind a lot is something fairly uh, interesting and optimistic. Uh, we are shifting, I think, from a material world to a digital world. Uh, young people think about the world in terms of digital flows, not in terms of material stuff. And if we look at history as going from agriculture to industry to digital and going through a big transformation and doing that, it seems to me there's the opportunity to bring in uh, the aspects of the economy and society that we currently have in, in a critical way and look for alternatives. 
And that moving towards a digital world actually licenses a lot of new creative thinking that we're not getting to in the normal conversations where people say they're interested in what a transformation would look like. Because they don't say what a transformation would be to. Uh, it's always negative. And we don't like this, we don't like that, but no positive view. So I'm gonna propose that, that society moving towards a digital intuition for how flows uh, happen is a tremendous opportunity to rethink society. Uh, end of thought. Doug, I'm not sure whether that's good or bad because the difference between digital and the analog that the humanity grew up with is uh, requires certain techniques because uh, when you do digital samples, right, you're taking just chunks of reality and trying to assemble that mentally. And I'm not sure that society moving to a digital existence is that great because not that many people understand the special techniques required to deal with digital samples. Uh, Julian, was that your check-in? Uh, no. Okay, we're still in check-in mode. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Jerry, can I check in while I'm parked? I was just hoping you would do that. Well, Kathleen and I are traveling from Washington, D.C. down to Knoxville and then Asheville. I'm uh, giving a talk tomorrow at University of Tennessee at a big data. Actually, it's, it's more interesting than just big data. It's a meeting of the data center managers around the US government and around academia. These are people who collect various types of science data and try to make sure that we have our data heritage archived and available. And they're going through quite a bit of a crisis right now because everybody wants data. They all are convinced that it's the secret to machine learning, but nobody wants to create some kind of sustainable way to fund all this data collection, archiving, uh, and particularly they're struggling with the incredible explosion in the amount of data that's being produced. So that's one of the things that's on my mind. But I think the more interesting thing is what I'm dealing with personally. Both of us are, are, are right now over our head dealing with some of the most dysfunctional systems in our country. Uh, Klaus mentioned the food industry, which I agree is completely dysfunctional. But two weeks ago, Kathleen bought this new car that we're driving in. And interestingly enough, car sales is one place where we've made some improvements. And it's partly because the new competitors came in and started being more transparency and about more transparent about pricing. And we actually had a pretty good car buying experience this time. On the other hand, the car repair uh, system is even worse. Uh, and I think it's because the car sales, the car dealers don't make enough money on the margins anymore. So they have to exploit you when you come in with your car. Uh, I found out the other day that my old, old er, a hy hybrid, which I'd had for many years, wasn't repaired properly by the dealership last time. They actually put in the wrong transmission fluid. So for you know a couple thousand miles, it wasn't functioning properly. And then I, so I took it back. They didn't diagnose the problem they had caused. They found three other problems. It was almost like they wanted to find enough problems that I would sell the car and buy a new one from them. When I took the same car to an independent dealer, they didn't find any of the problems that the dealer had found. So again, this is one system. We also just put an offer on a, a new house five hours ago. Well, we're excited about this. We probably have a one in five chance of getting the house because the Arlington market is pretty strange and, and bubbly. But there we have a real problem with 
a system that is not com consumer friendly and you know our our realtor could make forty thousand dollars for about 50 hours of work um that's better than most lawyers and aside from hollywood divorce lawyers i i guess the reason is that we don't know if we'll get this first bid we don't know if we'll get our fifth bid so he might have to do a hell of a lot more work but he already made a hell of a lot of money selling my last my my old house and if kathleen i mean we're planning to sell kathleen's townhouse and so that'll be our third interaction with the real estate business and then the last source of anxiety is that my doctor who took care of me for the last four years and before that his father took care of me for 25 years my doctor decided to not be part of a practice he became a concierge doctor so rather than going in and getting paid per treatment you um pay two thousand four hundred dollars up front they give you a full physical and then they promise to be available whenever you're needed but they focus entirely on wellness and so it's it's it, it all the incentives are right it's a much better system but it's only available really to the wealthy and your insurance does not cover this stuff your insurance will cover a lot of the testing but the interaction with the concierge doctor is you know, on your own fascinating change fascinating challenge to the really really inefficient system we have today but enough complaining about why things aren't working the way they are we all know that i'm a super optimist and i i have to believe that over time if the politicians don't get in the way we'll get there and i don't know if kathleen wants to add anything to our real estate adventures but uh pray to the uh, uh if you have any real real estate karma send some our way we do think we found you know the house that is like 90 percent right and that's pretty hard to do in this market where nobody is selling because everybody who has a three percent mortgage doesn't want to take on a, a six percent mortgage so we're getting back on the road i will listen in with interest and if anybody has any answers to the question how do we save all this data and make it available for the uh machine learning algorithms of the future let me know and by the way what does the polishing the pearl is that the polishing the pearl okay now i know this is we couldn't see it on the phone <laughs> yeah it, it's a it's a new hand sign i learned at the modern elder academy and it's sort of self-explanatory and and when somebody says something that that you want to offer support for it's kind of this gesture and it feels complementary to our usual gestures And Shimon, I think you know you're up and you're taking any optional time to jump in for a pause, but I'm not sure, so I'm saying that. And you're muted, we cannot hear you. Actually, you're not muted, but we can't hear you. Your mic isn't picking up your voice. Shoot, still not working. Check your mic settings in Zoom. Pull out any devices you have connected. Switch to sign language. Yeah. Still not hearing you. Shoot. If you want to try dropping out and coming back in or whatever, maybe that'll fix it. Don't know. But we'll make, make noises and we'll tell you when we hear you.
So um, I've noticed that there's a level of anxiety in me that has gone up substantially in the last week as I've been looking at the climate news. Uh, ocean hotter in, in Florida than it's ever been. Um, 152 degrees in the Persian Gulf the other day. Um, worst forest fire uh, his, uh, season in history, and it hasn't even started in Canada yet. Just all these things. And I'm wondering, you know, um, I've been following climate news for about 35, 36 years now. And, and it's very possible that the oceans have absorbed as much of the heat, pretty much all the heat they're going to absorb, all the carbon they're going to absorb. And now it'll be the land absorbing the heat. So um, this level of background uh, change um dramatic background change uh which i think a lot of people are like oh it's just you know it'll, it'll pass the heat dome will pass and we'll be fine we'll go back to normal i don't think normal is ever going to come back um and I, I i find myself you know i get to pee in the middle of the night and i lay there and i go oh man the planet is really getting hot you know like and and the weather extremes that come from that and and the way that'll interfere with crop loss and and you know droughts and fires and floods just like i have a uh i've been living with a background radiation level of of climate unease for many years but it has suddenly jumped up an order of magnitude and um don't have a lot of places to talk about that most people don't want to talk about that they don't want to face that uh it's like oh no no, no we're not gonna look there you know um so i'm just sitting with that and you know doing my practice and trying to uh to go, okay, well, that's reality. I don't have a lot that I can personally do about that. Um, and I've been really lucky here in the Bay Area this morning. It's 58 degrees out there, you know, uh, with the fog. Um, we have not suffered. We had three days last week when it got over 90, but it never went over 100, um, where everybody else around us is, is frying. So I feel personally really blessed, but uh, we're lucky. Um, but I'm just recognizing that this is a new level of anxiety for me that is hard to uh hard to sit with hard to be with and even harder when i consider that there's every possibility very very slim possibility of reverse and every possible but many many possibilities it's gonna get a lot worse so um just wanted to put that out there that that's very present uh the the background has become the foreground with regard to climate for me i don't know how the people are feeling about that but it's really been on my mind Thank you. Shimon, if you want to say a word, we'll see it, tell you if we hear you. Can you hear me now? You are loud and clear. So take your time whenever you'd like to step in. The floor is yours. Yeah, I apologize. Occasionally I have problems with my mic. Uh, it's really nice to be back in conversation or presence with the group. It's been a while. Uh, on a semi-personal note, I've uh, cut down on the number of patients that I see, and that allowed me today to participate. I usually had patients at this particular time. Uh, I, during the time I have not been present at the actual uh, meetings, I've benefited a lot from the email chains and actually through that have discovered quite a lot of very helpful and interesting ideas and people have actually uh, become part of the EXO community, which focuses on AI and the decision-making group there, which I have found to be very, very interesting and helpful. Uh, on my own kind of interest and in activities, I continue to be, if people remember, I got a little, dis not distracted, but off from my main focus, which is a problem that I occasionally have, uh, dealing with the Israeli constitutional pro you know, uh, issues. It's a lot more serious than antiquities, finding their way to you know, uh, Mar-a-Lago. And uh, so, you know, I've been actually, trying to write about the constitutional structure, connecting with some people. And uh, although that's been extremely interesting for me, having 
grown up in Israel and not paying as much attention politically and culturally over the years that I've been in the States, it's been really fascinating just following some of the discussions about democracy in Israel, participating in some of the democracy forums, including groups that are seeking to create an Israeli constitution, and really learning through that quite a lot about the American political system and some of the challenges that we have, in particular, the dangers that a strict ideology, whether it's religious and otherwise, can have a, to a democratic liberal values. So it's been very informative. But recently, I've been uh, back to my interest in what I call now democracy of opportunity. And that's a project that looks to go beyond affirmative action in various ways to try to equalize the playing field, to go back to like the first thousand days of life and think about what are the requirements for people to flourish. And that sort of like goes into quite a lot of the biological, psychological, religious, philosophical, and various other aspects of what's required, and certainly deals with the, you know, the local environment, food availability. And I'm still working with Jeff McDonald in Australia. We're developing quite a lot of modeling, agent-based modeling, and looking at the commercial determinants of health, which is uh, what are the commercial entities and how they exert power and define well-being in communities. So that's what I'm working on. And I actually launched uh, what I call my new media company, which is more consistent with what the free press was supposed to be. And, uh, uh, and I'm hoping to launch it soon. It's called The Citizen Brief. So... That's my chicken. Can I briefly add something? Just, I have actually found to the discussion about AI, I'm a really lousy writer, and I've found that AI, I'm using a particular program of, you know, like the large learning, uh, and I have found it extremely helpful, very helpful with creative stuff. For example, one of the things that I had it do as a conversation with fetus about what rights and what they need in terms of, you know, well-being and write a letter to their parents and then create a manifesto. And I've actually been finding it to be extremely creative. So that's going to be including in the citizen brief, which is very uh, early stages.
I think Zoom user is John Kelly. There it is. Yep. Uh, John, we're doing a check-in round in case you want to check in. Uh, there's a couple of people who haven't gone yet, and then we'll shift into a conversation mode or anybody who hasn't gone can pass, whatever. But that's where we are. Yeah, I was, um, I'm in a car, which you can tell, and I'm, I'm at a red light and I was going to try to get to where I could just pull over <laughs> before I tried to check in. But uh, yeah, we'll try it. Let's, let's see how it goes. Pretty safe. Uh, what I'm doing here is now just getting to this place where I can, where I can pull over. So it's, it's pretty clear. Um, by way of check-in, uh, it's been about a month since I uh, attended something called the uh, distributed web or the decentralized web. I'm sorry. That's interesting how, how easily, you know, we, we migrate the terms. Um, just merge here, get to the pullover point. Um, we work, you know, there's a, it's been going on for five years. It's, uh, it's an interesting effort. It's a little like the internet identity workshop in that there's a core of people who are deeply technical, who, who need to be deeply involved in protocols and, and questions that, that drive ordinary non-technical people to uh, tear their hair out because they're just so uh, inaccessibly obscure. But then if you just kind of push that aside and, and listen, uh, you realize that, uh, oh, wait a minute, there's another set of questions here. There's a set of policy questions that are really amazing. I mean, they're really incredible and they affect everything and that we need to pay attention to them. So um, that was the experience at the camp. There were, there were uh, 450 people there, an amazing set of conversations. I'll just, I'm going to super condense one of the things that we, one of the things that came up in the camp. And it was the idea that we need to, Decentralized power, but centralized coordination. And I think that that's a lot. I mean, not, not that that's easy to do. That is that is a major challenge. Is how do you do that? Because what is the incentive to coordinate if, if the power has been decentralized? You know, how do you, how do you still shape the power in such a way that it incentivizes coordination? So that was a big one. Uh, the other big issue at the camp was that we were kind of washed over by the whole burst of AI and ChatGPT. And we had OpenAI there. And um, the people from AI, from OpenAI were personally very open, personally very approachable one-to-one, -one, but they, they clearly had had a rehearsal and they clearly said, you know, oh, absolutely, no, dangerous things. We, yeah, well, we're, we're watching for that. We're watching, we don't see it yet. We don't see those things coming, but we're watching. And we'd like your help. You know, let keep let's keep watching, and and yeah, we need regulation, and that's as far as they would go. And and to their, you know, to their defense, I have to say I don't know how they could go much further, as not and not just because they have a vested interest in the particular open AI stance, but yeah, the next level when you go beyond those questions are is really nasty. I mean, really challenging, really, uh, really wicked in the in the wicked problem sense. Um, I was I was very uh, I recognize Shimon's comments about the creativity potential of AI. I'm I'm noticing that a little bit. Uh, not I, I haven't been able to fully unleash it in the work that I'm doing, but I can see that it's there, and I'm looking forward to that. And um, in general, uh, you know, just Thinking across the, the span of issues that we address, uh, <laughs> from climate change, food, et cetera. I mean, we definitely need to uh, do a better job of centralizing coordination and, and distributing power in a way that's different than the, than the accidental late capitalist version that we're now in. So that's my check-in.
I'm wondering if Gil is trying to talk. I keep seeing his note takers microphone going on and off. <laughs> and I'm pondering whether the automated note taker is going a little crazy with the silence and thinking, oh my God, what's wrong? What's wrong? Something's got to be happening. <laughs> I, I think that's something they never anticipated when they designed these darn things. Uh, have, you know, have, have have any have any AIs been trained on Quaker meetings, Jerry? I imagine that would be a long, slow process. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> or John Cage music. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, that uh, there, so there's a project for somebody to do a, a silence focused AI. It'd be fun. A um, little item came across my feed this morning that. Um, that a couple of months ago, ChatGPT was running 98% accurate on mathematical tasks, and now it's running 2% accurate, which reminds me of the wonderful Bucky Fuller quote that you can never learn less, but obviously he never met ChatGPT. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I've, been, I've been quiet. I appreciate listening. I've been... Um, taking some time to catch up on the chat, but I'm, I'm feeling very tired this morning um, and not focused. Um, and um, wasn't present to the part of this that I think, Ken, you touched on of the, you know, the gathering darkness. Um, I've also been, you know, uh, in the climate change, climate crisis, regenerative sustainability, et cetera, world for a very long time. Um, um, but at a more um, global, societal, abstract strategy level, and not as not feeling it as much as at a personal level, and I'm now feeling as as I think is happening to a lot of people around the planet, much more cognizant of the personal impact that this will have on me and the people that I love and our readiness or our lack of readiness for that. Um, um, sorry, the synapses are not completely syncing this way. Uh, what, what was it John Kelly said about centralized coordination? <laughs> Coordination's not happening. Um, but there was a point I wanted to share on that. Um, Climate, climate temperature, readiness. It escapes me at the moment. It may be come back. I'm I'm reminded um, watching the news and listening to Ken about the Ministry for the Future, Kim Stanley Robinson's book. I don't know if people haven't read it. It's a it's a it's an important read for this time. It it took me four tries to read it, to get enough momentum to be able to get through the first few chapters, which were just agonizing in um, in a, you know, in a fictionalized version of what these temperatures could mean is, you know, basically a climate disaster in India that takes out 20 million people. Um, but real, tangible, touchable. Um, um, so, so that's there in the background. Um, 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 without going, without going into a lot of detail, um, Jane has entered a next a next round of cancer treatment. So uh, my caregiver life has risen again, um, and it's you know it, stuff is good. Based let me let me say briefly, stuff is good, but stuff is uncertain. And uh, you know I think we face a future of a lot of ups and downs personally as well as in the world surrounding us. So. Um, yeah, thanks, Hank. Um, I was really struck by Doug's comment, uh, not so much about the digital world, but about um, what happens when we focus on what we don't like, what we don't want, and compared to what happens when we focus on what we do want. Uh, and the media culture that we live in is, you know, a, a lot of it is focused on what we don't like. Uh, what's not good. It's very easy to complain. We found a piece of this um, in the Living Between Worlds call that Ken and I co-hosted yesterday. Um, where, um, Ken, you may have to help me here because my brain is really, really soggy this morning. It's odd. Um, um, the 
where we we had we had um, invited people to do a pre-reading of a remarkable piece by Rebecca Solnit. I I can't put the link in the chat at the same time now. The long piece in the Guardian a couple of years ago. Ken, maybe you can drop that in. Um, and we invited people to talk about what that reading provoked for them. And um, was one question, and the other was um, no. I guess it was different than that. It was. Um, um, where are people? Where, how are people grant, grounding themselves in these times, and where do they look to for inspiration, uh, examples of success, uh, uh, seeds of the possible, uh, and um, and in a number of the breakout groups that I was in, um, people didn't respond to the prompt, but talked about what, you know, what's fucked up. Um, and I just observed how challenging it is, even in a safe, uh, 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 familiar and well-facilitated space to guide the conversation toward the, what, the world that we want, as opposed to the world that we don't want. Um, yeah, Ken, thank you for posting that. You may have something to add about that, but I was struck by that. And um, um, and I guess that's some of what I'm expressing for myself this morning. I'm more present to the to the challenge and the darkness and the impending grief. Jane's been listening a lot to Joanna Macy, who again, I, somebody else, a voice that I commend to you, just a brilliant, deeply, deeply thoughtful Buddhist grounded um, teacher and, mod and modern sage uh, 95 and still going at it. Um, and one of the things that she's taught over the years, well, two of the things that she's taught over the years, one is, is to, um, uh, not flee from the grief. That the grief is one of the doorways into life. Um, and, um, and a remarkable thing she did many years ago called thinking like a mountain which is about how to put ourselves in a different relationship with the living world uh, and each other. So I, and yeah, sustaining the gaze. Thank you, Ken. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying here is I'm feeling increasingly drawn to that work right now. Uh, even as most of my effort is focused on what's the world we want, what's the world that's possible. Um, how do we get there? Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm struck that a lot of people say nothing's, you know, nothing good is happening. Nobody's doing anything. Nobody's planning for, for the world we want. And um, in the networks that I travel in, I see, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of initiatives around the globe that are, um, fiercely alive and vital and creative and committed and collaborative. Uh, uh, those aren't the stories that the mainstream media tells, never has, probably never will. Uh, and so part of, um, of uh, focusing on the world we want is finding ways to tell and share those stories. Uh, we're, in, we're in a battle for the story of the world. Um, and that's, and, and that has profound impact on the larger, more overt, explicit battles that we find ourselves in. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, that's me this morning. It feels a little, I, I feel, I feel odd to myself this morning. Uh, and I appreciate this space because after this, I've got to dive into a, a series of calls where I need to be. Uh, you know, bright and functional and generative. Uh, and I wasn't sure how I was going to get there. This this listening to you all and having this opportunity to speak helps me uh, ground and orient to that. So thank you. I've spoken. There are a couple of us who haven't gone. Uh, we could go like this. You could pass explicitly. I, I wanted to announce one thing that I haven't seen sort of make the media yet that I think Gil and Ken know about. 
for any of you who know uh, Peter and Trudy Johnson lens, um, we lost Peter last Friday. So they had had a very hard time the last few years. Um, and Peter uh, went to hospital in an emergency on Friday and, and died. So um, many of us have known P plus T for a long time. They, they lived life as a couple. They had a single email address. Uh, uh, very unusually, I didn't know that from anybody else. And uh, so uh, those of us who've been trying to help them are now hopefully going to be able to help Trudy a bit differently. But I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, Jerry. I remember <clears throat> reading some of their work God, back in the 80s when they actually talked about how technology could facilitate democracy on a local level, but getting everyone participating. It was seminal and, and the ideas were absolutely beautiful. So thank you for sharing. I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of more pieces, uh, you know, call it a, call it a check-in. Um, but I have to share first that this is a funny experience that the folks that were brought up uh, in the Jewish faith will appreciate. I'm sitting on this pillow and this pillow has fringe on the end of it. And all of a sudden I had this flash of being a kid with a talus on and playing with the fringe on the talus as a kid in synagogue. <laughs> Just a, a sharing, a sharing piece. I see some smiling faces. Um, Thought everybody did. <laughs> and that evoked, you know, the Orthodox Jews that wear something called tzitzis, which are kind of things that hang out at the bottom of their 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 shirt uh, it's kind of i guess the equivalent of of um lds um undergarments in some ways um which i had never thought of before um I, first thing i want to do is just kind of um say I, uh, I agree with everything that gill said and honor his wisdom and i think we have to be careful in the language we use. When I heard the battle for the planet of the earth, it immediately creates a, an us versus them, a win versus lose. Um, and, I, and I think that that kind of thinking is um, in some ways, you know, <clears throat> what the media certainly promotes with argutainment, but has led to some of the um, challenges we face. Um, on a personal note, um, I'm working on two writing projects. One is um, the third edition of the Thoughtful Citizens Handbook, which has moved from um, democracy uh, and elections in the US to a much broader global perspective. Jerry has actually agreed to write the chapter in techno technology uh, and its impact on thoughtful citizenship. And uh, it's no mean task to condense into a, a, a short six to eight page chapter or four pages, whatever it turns out to be. Yeah, that's why it's taking it's taking a while. It's like the the old, I don't know, it was attributed to Churchill, I think. Sorry I wrote such a long letter. I didn't have enough time to write a short one. Um, so, and the other writing project is um, combining um, some of my models for agreement and conflict resolution with poetry and what I'm seeing going on in the world um, today and how to apply some of these um, models and communication techniques on a micro level because I realized years ago that in some ways everything starts at a micro level. It just does, you know, it, it, it's at an individual level. It's not the broad big pieces, but it's more about how, how individuals act with each other. 
Um, and the third thing I want to report is that, because um, I shared with this group about a, a multiple myeloma diagnosis, which which Gil has been on the uh, on the path of for many years with his wife. Um, everything at this point in time seems to be going in the right direction. For me, the blood work is coming back into normal ranges. Um, uh, tolerating the medicines uh, fairly well, and uh, some energy is returning, um, you know, big time. Um, so that is um, that has become another piece of the learning experience uh, on this uh, journey called life. So thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> And, you know, remission happens and people go out of remission, as Gil has had the experience of, but tend to live and hang out for, for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I've been searching for some good stuff, right, for some more uplifting and, and, uh, um encouraging signals and i'm really excited that uh, kevin uh and i will will uh have uh, an exchange in a couple of weeks from now jerry uh, is putting us on the schedule um and uh what we are going to do is interview each other so kevin is going to interview me i'm going to interview kevin uh, because we're both working now on really local stuff so Kevin is way into uh, projects in his community, and and uh, I'm into looking at how can you support communities, you know, doing things, and you know how how can this all work? And I'm also getting into uh, my own community here to see how, um, particularly, fun the the function of the base of pyramid economy. Right, because that's where the need is. Now, when you think that the US government spends over $100 billion a year on nutritional assistance programs, which are highly controversial, but to me, what that really demonstrates is a complete market failure. You know, there is no place in the world where uh, the government spends that kind of money to feed some 16% of their population um, or more. You know, the well, the, the, there are subsidies for specific food types you know like the, the, the egypt will import you know but then the distribution of these products and the way that these products uh, reach the consumer uh, is a completely different thing and so here we are outright paying you know give people money so then they can spend that money at walmart you know and, and kroger which uh, you know, uh, uh, you know sells food at, uh, to, to a population that doesn't have health insurance and doesn't have dental care that uh, uh, you know, is damaging their health. But anyway, um, there, there really is uh, a lot of opportunity for people to do something. And there is a hunger. I can feel also when I'm working with the Sarah Club, there's a hunger for people wanting to do stuff in their community and just don't know where to go and how to move this and, and, and make it work. So anyway, two weeks from now, we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I just wanted to add in, uh, to the idea of um, as far as what we focus on the negative or positive, that I, I just want to suggest that a way to present those things are, this is how one challenge was solved. Here was a problem. Mm -hmm. Here's how it was solved. Because I think that that really stimulates thinking. And I think people enjoy watching that. So as far as the concern over ratings and th things like that, I actually think people will watch because they enjoy thinking about, oh, how would I have done that? Or they can also walk away with things that, and apply it to their situations. So I, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of the negative because we want to focus on the positive and only focus on the positive because there's obviously negative that needs to be addressed. Thank 
Thanks, Stacey. Um, we're nearing the end of our call time, so I'll step in a tiny sure. bit. Uh, I've, from the start of our call, I've been pondering a question I'll type into the chat now, which is too big a question to deal with right now. And I know that there's a few young people who are suing one of our states, I think, for malfeasance, but there's so much loss of life and, and displacement going on now that it seems like irresponsible actions need to be remedied somehow. So my question, can we, can we, and I know which we sue conservatives for damage that they're causing? Is there a class action case here or several layers of class action cases in lots of courts around the world? Uh, is there lots to do there? Um, Stuart, thank you for the poem you're posting in the chat. And uh, Ken, I believe, has a poem. And if you'd like to um, go there, that uh, will gentle us down out of this call. A little Mary Oliver today, I think. Uh, the Journey. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Though the whole house began to tremble mm -hmm. and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, <clears throat> though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late. It was already late enough and a wild night and a road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, you left their voices behind. The stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that you kept you that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. Mm. The journey, Mary Oliver. I'd like to pause with that for just a second and then read a different poem titled The Journey by David huh. White, huh. which is likewise really special. Um, so let me wait a second and then I'll, I'll read this in. The Journey by David White. Above the mountains, the geese turn into the light again, painting their black silhouettes on an open sky. Sometimes everything has to be inscribed across the heavens so you can find the one line already written inside you. Sometimes it takes a great sky to find that first bright and indescribable wedge of freedom in your own heart. Sometimes with the bones of the black sticks left when the fire has gone out, someone has written something new in the ashes of your life. You are not leaving. Even as the light fades quickly now, you are arriving. Mm. And if anybody has watched David White perform his poems on YouTube, he repeats lines a lot in a way I can't go back and replicate well, but he will re he, re he re uh, recites from memory a ton, not just his poems, but other people's, and he will emphasize and underscore um, lines in a really beautiful way. Yeah, I, this is just a coincidence. I was looking at some of the books on my night table this morning, and um, one of them I picked out was a, a, a book that David signed um, when I was on one of his retreats. Mm. Um, and, um, and then I was reading, I'm reading a Pat Conroy book because I think he's one of the most beautiful novelists in terms of his psychological unpacking of characters and um one of the endorsements for pat conroy was uh, or, or no i can't remember if david white endorsed pat conroy or pat conroy <laughs> endorsed david white but it was just one of those moments of of, of beautiful um 
coincidence. <laughs> mm. Love that. Hanoi took a really terrible childhood and turned it into a lot of fantastic prose. Mm. And Hank, I think you might have the last word today. Yeah, I'd just like to add uh, that David White every couple of months does a series of uh, uh, readings uh, and recitations of his work. Uh, I'm I've been following him for a number of years. Right now, we're busy with uh, three Sundays in July that he'll probably skip August and go on to three Sundays in September. Uh, they're not always wonderful, but they're always inspiring. Uh, sometimes mm. he has not, doesn't have his day and he repeats himself a lot. And sometimes he's really right mm. into it. And when he repeats mm. it himself, as Jerry was saying, uh, mm. his message goes right to the head, right to the heart and right to the mm. hands. So I can highly mm. recommend following one of his series mm. of uh, Sunday uh, readings and recitations. Mm. Thank you. I hadn't. I didn't know he was doing that. That's really cool. Mm. Anyone else want to add anything before we wrap? Yeah. Once you've done about six of David's three Sundays, they start repeating themselves. <laughs> That doesn't take away from his brilliance, yeah. um, but it's just, you know, you can go on. And he, and he really is charging a reasonable amount for the three, for the three Sundays also. So it's, you know, it's, it's very accessible. He's also on sub, Substack now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. He's, he's like my favorite corporate poet in the sense of he really understands how to how to talk to companies and organizations. And I sometimes read Working Together, his poem, uh, the poem he was commissioned to write for Boeing for the launch of the 777, I think it was, uh, which is a lovely poem. Yeah, that's like his book in, in terms of corporate stuff, The Heart Aroused. Um, it was a prose book that got him into the corporate universe, you know, 25, 30 years ago, I think. Hmm. And, and as a fairly young man. Mm -hmm. If this link still works, then working together is right here. Thanks, everybody. This has been one of our quietest sort of soul felt calls and different from the others and lovely. I appreciate your, your being here. Thank you, Jerry. Have a great week. Yeah. Thanks. Goodbye, all. Enjoy the weekend. Hank, beautiful photos in Plex. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed those. Thanks for that uh, comment. I appreciate it. Bye. <laughs>